Welcome to Nevada and to the 2021 Art and Environment season. The Nevada Museum of Art has organized five exhibitions to serve as the backdrop for land art, past, present, futures. John Franco Gorgoni, Land Art Photographs, features 50 of this Italian photographer's most iconic images of earthworks in the American West. From Michael Heiser and Walter Di Maria to Nancy Holt and Robert Smithson, Gorgoni was on the ground in the late 1960s to help bring these projects to life. For nearly two decades, the Nevada Museum of Art has considered what is next for land art. We've collected archives and artworks for our permanent collection that look deeply at iconic earthworks. We've asked, who are the voices that have been left out of this dialogue? And what artists are critiquing the genre's most iconic artworks? We've worked with and commissioned artists who see land as part of a larger system. And we've acknowledged those who have known this and fought for this all along. Judy Chicago began making work in response to land art in the late 1960s. Her dry ice fireworks and atmospheres performances offered an alternative ephemeral engagement with the land. The Nevada Museum of Art recently acquired this archive and is debuting it for the first time. The desert has always attracted mischief makers. Those artists and dreamers who see and think differently, who aim to experiment in hopes of changing the world. High Desert Test Sites in Joshua Tree, California has offered artists this creative testing ground for over two decades. Rose B. Simpson's monumental earthen figures ascend from the gallery floor in her exhibition, The Four. Commissioned and recently acquired by the Nevada Museum of Art, their overwhelming presence reminds us all that land art and the land itself is more than just the earth beneath our feet. Hi everyone, welcome again. Uh, I'm Bill Fox, I'm the director of the Center for Art and Environment at the Nevada Museum of Art in Reno. Uh, it's a beautiful day outside. Uh, it's a clear autumnal blue sky and the uh, summit of Mount Rose, which is 10,775 feet, sits between Reno and Lake Tahoe, uh, is covered in snow. So we can feel winter uh, approaching and we can feel the season uh, beginning to come to a conclusion. This is, uh, we're about two, three events away from, from uh, wrapping things up with Lucy Lepard next week. So. Um, you know, as Ann Wolf, our chief curator, who just narrated that video said, we're celebrating 50 years uh, of land art. And we're doing that by bringing together artists and scholars and social activists to talk about where land art has been and where it is now and where we think it might be going. Um, so we talk about futures, plural, in that case. Today's conversation is between two very prominent uh, scholars of land art um, and art in general. Uh, Contemporary art, Suzanne Becker and Emily Eliza Smith, more about them in just a minute. Um, it's impossible to, to, to really discuss land art without acknowledging that the Nevada Museum of Art is located in a great basin um, and occupied territories of indigenous people here. The state of Nevada consists of 27 federally recognized tribes uh, in our lands here um, and from four nations. Uh, basically, it's uh, Northern Paiute, Western Shoshone, Washoe, uh, and Southern Paiute. It's really important for us to notice, to note the, that we have further research to do uh, and the integrate, to integrate the stories of the native peoples of this place uh, with the work that we do. And um, we share, uh, seek a shared commitment with those peoples as we move forward. And, and in, in fact, uh, the center hosts um, indigenous interns and curators and, and scholars. Uh, so, into that completely complicated mix. Um, we have a slightly long program to offer you today. Um, it's because as we get closer to the end of the season, there seems to be more and more to talk about. Um, so what I'm gonna do is briefly introduce Suzanne and Emily, and then I'm gonna get it off the screen, go away. Once Emily is done with her presentation, uh, then I'll be back to start handling questions and I'll be joined by my colleague, Christian Davies, who's our director of public programs. Christian um, monitors and manages um, the uh, Q&A feature. Uh, so if you have questions that you wish to pose to uh, Suzanne and to Emily, 
uh, use the Q&A button that's on the bottom of your screen. So um, we're also closed captioned, I believe. So use that feature if you need it. And again, there's a button available for that. Um, Suzanne and Emily are both longstanding and very good friends of the center. Um, Suzanne is an art historian and critic and lecturer in New York City. Um, she has a new biographical analysis of the work of Robert Smithson that's coming out uh, from the University of Minnesota Press in fall uh, of 2022. I'm so excited about that book, Suzanne. Um, her foundational text, uh, Earthworks, Art and the Landscape of the 60s was published by the University of California Press in 2303. Um, it's a book I've certainly relied on for years. Um, Suzanne is a prodigious scholar beyond that book. I, more than 360 articles, I, I, with final count, is probably getting closer to 400 at this point, um, has been published uh, in articles, uh, in journals and magazines and so forth. She's a member of the International Association of Art Critics, the Authors Guild, PEN America, and the College Art Association. So she is a complete professional, and we are so thrilled, uh, Suzanne, that you can be part of this program this year. Thank Emily you. Eliza Scott um, researches art and environmental justice, art and activism, critical approaches to the built environment, visual cultures of nature, land-based art from the present 1960s to the present. Um, it's a long, long bit here, so I'm reading from a piece of paper. She's co-edited three volumes, including the Rutledge Companion to Contemporary Art, Visual Culture, and Climate Change, edited with TJ Demos and, and Shabankar Banerjee. Uh, Rutledge released that title in 2021. And she's also co-edited Critical Landscapes, Art, Science, Politics uh, with uh, Kirsten Swenson from the UC Press in 2015. Um, at present, she's writing a book about contemporary art that tracks environmental violence as it's writ into land, air, and water. Um, among other ours, uh, she has been a Peter E. Poole Research Fellow here at the Center uh, for Art and Environment. Um, and most interestingly, also before entering academia, uh, she spent a decade, nearly a decade, as a National Park Service Ranger in Utah and Alaska. So she has boots on the ground with all of these matters. Um, with that, I think, Suzanne, I'm simply going to uh, turn it over to you. And I'll see uh, you and uh, Emily at the end of your presentations. Thanks. All right. Th greetings to everyone. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you very much for Bill for that introduction and to Anne and Bill for inviting me to participate, to Christian for your help and to Emily for her contributions to what I'm sure will be a stimulating exchange. As I have just completed the book manuscript, the book that Bill mentioned, my head is filled with Smithson. I'm sharing with you one of the 120 illustrations, many I found and like this one never before published. At 20, he's at 1960, he stands before his six and a half foot high painting, Hecate, turning the moon to blood, de de depicting a goddess that has been variously venerated for her power over menstruation, the earth, the home and sorcery, the last well represented in his book collection. Her three perspectives exemplify this conference's theme of past, present and futures. there. To first take Hecate's retrospect, I'd like to recognize a tendency in current scholarship and artists' response when considering first-generation earthworkers to either condemn them for lack of conscience or more often to idealize their aims, to imply that they were deliberately erasing history in regard to the violence with which the United States took possession of the land on which they marked mounded, masked, uh, hacked, and dynamited earth implies intentionality. That is either being ahistorical or provocative. Rather, the cultural consciousness of their period was not hostility to tribal lands, but utter obliviousness to the dec decimation that a century earlier had preceded their presence. On the other hand, nor were they even proto-environmentalists. As much as we admire these artists for their sculptural boldness, they didn't consider the earth more than a form of matter, which really didn't matter, allowing them to manipulate terrain distance from their residences at will. And having gotten out of the gallery for space and scale, they returned to it to sell and to make not just a buck, but a name for themselves. 
Many have argued, as he identified himself, that Smithson was an early reclamation artist. Examining that claim exemplifies changes this session addresses. Smithson transformed an edge of the small lake created by runoff from a sand quarry into a spatially environmental sculpture. It was part of an institutional exhibition dispersed across the Netherlands. Two years later, when he initiated an independent proposal to sculpturally transform the depleted copper Bingham copper mine in Utah, he returned to his proclivity for integrating a site's disruption. The concentric terracing that seared the three mile wide strip mined hole would be left intact. The re remediation of the grand ravished bowl would not be ecological, but aesthetic. Like his spiral jetty, it would be awesome to view, but, but would not alter the earth or engender plants or organisms. 30 years after Smithson's proposal, Jackie Bruckner's gift of water, commissioned for near Dresden, Germany, functions as a part of a natural filtration system, turning wetlands into a swimming pool. The water is cleaned without the use of chlorine or other chemicals, entirely by being filtered by plants. The mossy cupped hands comprise what Bruckner called a bio-sculpture made of a durable textile. They incorporate a misting fountain that aerates the sculpture and moistens the purifying mosses. Their pose calls up a Buddhist mudra or symbolic gesture, such as a varada, palms open and touching the earth, signifying charity. The porous quality of Bruckner's bio sculptures, they are made, but they grow mosses, productively elide several distinctions. Is it art or is it nature? Is it nature made, grown, or is it artist made? Is it a utilitarian water cleaner stemming from an ethical response to caring for nature or a sensory and aesthetic stimulant to contemplation of a greater whole? This is central to environmentalist art, fusing former dichotomies of nature is there and art is here and functionality is design and abstract thinking is art and ethical impetus is political art and formal concerns only pertain to the aesthetic. In the best environmentalist art, all of these are in play. The assertion by an art historian whose work I admire, Julian Meyer Sapinska, that Michael Heiser's dragged mass exemplifies Heiser's attitude of being against absolute city systems and that it evokes urban dispossession and colonialism sounds to me like wishful thinking speaking more to our desire to engage with social injustices than that artist's beliefs 50 years ago. Heiser's anti-urban pos position reflected his anti-social, not to say misanthropic character. Almost as soon as he got from Berkeley to downtown New York among the cerebral minimalists, he retreated to the West to work in isolation, forbidding visitors. His compensatory aggressive works made prior to or ensuing from dragged mass do not confirm social engagement, rather consistent with vanguard arts ethos of the day, they display no concern for marginalized or mistreated others. But both dragged mass and Smithson's partially buried woodshed served well as screens for viewers projections that the artists were channeling the degradation of the post-war communitas of a nation of victors enjoying an expansive economy, which in the 1970s fractured into social political instability. And Smithson was the artist who with Richard Serra seen here figuring out how to alter the unsatisfactory first stage of the spiral jetty were accused by Lucy Lepard of preferring to play with themselves at the bar at Max's Kansas City rather than participate in the art workers coalition or take stances in anti-war or other timely activism. A source of Smithson's charmed career is that his characteristic mordant temperament expressed at 17 in his ruined building and at 24 in my house as a decayed house, 1962, 
synced with the late 1960s apprehension that the culture was undergoing social entropy, that is, loss of order. So I'm not saying that historical works of art are analytically untouchable, but on the contrary, that attention to an artist's individual inclinations within social and art history adds interpretive complexity. Colleen Smith's moving, if shocking, video remote viewing, riffs on Smithson's transgressive engulfing of a structure in dirt with a narrative regarding a violent institute instance of racism. Her move presents another iconic duality representative of this triennial, a transition from what were taken at the beginning of land art to be chiefly sculptural issues to what the present emphasizes as environmentalist and social work. But there's more. In a latent unity between Smithson's buried woodshed and Smith's buried school, both structures rem rem resemble houses, can be taken to be like homes, sites of intimate interactions, and both lament the loss of it as a haven and convey that loss that has itself been buried, that is suppressed. These sentiments span history. The first of this Nevada triennial sessions included an astute inquiry from the audience. Aren't you concerned that you are expanding the parameters of the genre beyond recognition of the genre of land art? As I've watched these, I've been concerned. Let's go back to 1991. Here I am doing doctoral research at Heiser's Double Negative, the place where I had the epiphany in 115 degree heat. And after having been marooned the day before on the pulverized road leading up to the Mesa, that earthworks weren't at all about what the critics had led me to believe, responding to Mother Earth in some covert affiliation with the pastoral. Yikes, with lizards skittering around me, I realized this is wilderness. Earthworks were about space, scale, phenomenological rapture, and cowboy machismo, not nature or stewardship of it, and also about making a mark professionally, which Justin Favela has also achieved in his appropriation of it for a Latinx family fiesta. The next generation land art was more gentle upon the earth, particularly by women. Michelle Stewart typifies that, and as well exemplifies the transition of earthworks funding by private patronage. How is about you and me flying out to Nevada to see some of the earthworks I've financed? A satire on taxicab mogul and art collector Robert Skull's support of Heiser to land arts common instigation by institutions. In 1979, the Portland Center of the Visual Arts commissioned Stewart to make stone alignment solstice cairns above Oregon's East Columbia Gorge the Cairn terminated axis of the 100 foot diameter stone ring delineate magnetic north, the point of sunrise and sunset on the longest day of the year. Like other astronomically aligned land art constructions, it was designed to connect viewers to primal circuitry. I'd like to demonstrate a, tra a trajectory parallel, but distinct from that of earthworks to social work by looking at Scottish American artist, Patricia Layton, who has maintained sensitivity to visual, sensory, and formal elements while encouraging attention to nature. In 1992, Layton was commissioned by the American Motorola Corporation to create a connection to place at Bathgate, Scotland, where it would build their international cellular division. Geological matter excavated for the construction was used with geotech reinforcements to maintain shape. The forms connect to regional history, past industry, and geological formations. Walkways along a stream promote contemplative viewing. Sited adjacent to a major east-west roadway, it provides aesthetic stimulation as well as suggesting propulsive flow. In 2001, Leighton and her partner, sculptor Del Geist, 
were commissioned by the US General Service Administration to create a site-specific environmental work passage. Five Precambrian boulders from local terrain, 1.3 billion years old, are elevated alluding to their original eruption from the terrain, as well as honoring them. They are sited among 18 earthworks on a 1,000 foot corridor, their forms suggesting the area's sand dunes and glacial cirques that preceded civilization. Layton's latest commission from a guest ranch in Tucson, Arizona, will be like the growing sculptures Terra Verte she installed at the Georgia Museum of Art. The steel elevated cubes have leaky tubes to irrigate the local flowering plants seated in them. These two images could be considered framing fringes of land art. During the same period that Alan Capro was proposing lightly scripted group happenings in the spring of 1961, he made his wacky, joyful jumble of tires, objects of our everyday life, he called them in the courtyard of the Martha Jackson Gallery in Manhattan for the influential exhibition, Environments, Situations, Spaces. In turn, the immersive milieu of Capro's yard was in conversation with art history, calling up Jackson Pollock's expansive canvases of flung arcs, whose weighty posthumous legacy Capro had heralded in art news. Years later, the lateral encompassing physicality of the installation was flipped outdoors to rough earthen environments. At the end of the century, Edward Bertinsky's Oxford Tire Pile presents a sad version of Capro's pile. Illustrating development, consumption, and the burden of garbage squeezing off access to a distant idyllic green, the image poignant and visually compelling. The fact that this is a photograph corresponds to the collapse of any coherent practice of land art as an autonom autonomous sculptural project. I doubt any artist today identifies with being a land artist. Rather, this triennial and its exhibition suggest that the category of land art now seems to encompass any sort of art that is located on or pictures land and it has become a vehicle for responding not just to the deteriorating biosphere, but to social wrongs, an attitude concomitant to intensifying awareness of climate and social crises. The dominant approach is purposeful, that is polemical, to direct people's attention, to change their ways of thinking. Primary emphasis is subject matter through cognitive perception, as in so much art since the 60s, ideas have eclipsed craft. But I wonder, is that effective as persuasion? And as art, is it enough? Veteran eco-artist Christy Rupp brought attention to marine damage from the 2010 Macondo BP well blowout in a series examining the Gulf of Mexico's planktonic microfauna. These filtering organisms digest anything in their habitat. After the spill, they took in petroleum and dispersant and were then consumed by larger fish, bioaccumulating it in deeper into all the bodies and sediments throughout the water column, moving the toxic chemicals up the food chain to humans. These wall pieces in welded steel and encaustic wax from 2010, 11, each about 18 inches long, represent chlorophyta, crab, and barnacle. This year, Rupp created a filtered project in filter project in response to the degradation of a creek local to her, a main tributary in the upper Hudson River in New York State. Because of increasing rain in the Northeast, muddy water washes down from the mountain watersheds due to excessive releases of water in the reservoir dam by the New York State Department of Environmental Protection, silt washes downstream, burying the eggs and seeds of next year's generations of life. 
that inhibits the ability of trout to spawn and diminishes larvae that freshwater fish depend upon to thrive, leaving in its wake only the species that are attracted to degraded habitats and invasives. Rupp again, Rupp again designed metal forms to represent marine species, this time covering them with fine cloth. She placed them in different locations along the creek, immersing them for weeks to filter and trap the mud in the turbid release. They make manifest that fine particles of mud are slowly suffocating aquatic life. This is barnacle both a demonstration of degradation and when scrubbed of residue, an evocatively attractive object. As art, Rupp's work seemed to be taking the position that if you want people to be environmentalists, give them art they need to closely attend to and from which they will derive sensory and material satisfaction and even emotional identification and political engagement will follow. I'll stop here by returning to Smithson and a few of the responses to his spiral jetty so we can pick up these issues in the Q&A. Take it away, Emily. Can everyone hear me okay? Great, thank you so much, Suzanne and Bill and Anne and Christian and everyone else who has made this event possible today. Um, it's been such a stunning lineup of speakers um, I've had the luxury to attend, I think all of them up until now or to listen to the recordings. And uh, it's really been, a, it, it's a real privilege to participate. I also was lucky enough to visit uh, all of the exhibitions on view currently at the Nevada Museum of Art because I was working in the archives at the Center for Art and Environment um, last month in Reno. So again, really thrilled to be here today. Um, I'm going to speak um, hopefully um, so it'll be roughly 20 minutes, hopefully not more, because I'm really looking forward to getting to the Q&A and discussion afterwards with all of you. Um, but a couple of things I'd like to say first, when Bill Fox approached Suzanne and me um, separately with his idea to devote one session to art and environmentalism from a scholarly perspective, I was curious to take up the charge. Um, and I think it's interesting um, that environmentalism as a term is one that has, um, been very scant in the conversations to date in the series. And I think there are interesting reasons why that's probably true that maybe we can get into as well. Um, uh, we have the advantage of being one of the later events in the series. And so of course I have many thoughts and questions that have accumulated along the way. Um, so first a few uh, initial thoughts on the term land art uh, before I move on to environmentalism. Um, if we look at the speakers uh, in this series, or if we look at the artworks that are currently on view at the Nevada Museum of Art in the Land Art Exhibition, or likely if we were to um, sort of go around the room and hear from all the audience members who are here with us right now, um, I'm fairly certain that there are varying levels of interest and investment in this nebulous category, land art, and or in solidifying it and securing it within the canon of art history. In some cases, well-known uh, earthworks, as Suzanne also shared in her presentation, have been central points of reference or foils for contemporary artists. So here we see Justin Favela's Family Fiesta at double negative from 2015. Um, and we see on the upper right, a still from Colleen Smith's Remote Viewing, a piece from 2010, um, and below it, Renee Green's Partially Buried from 1996, 1997, both works of which, of course, are um, making reference to Robert Smithson's Partially Buried Woodshed. Uh, in other cases, land art as a term or genre uh, is of more distance relevance or not much at all. So um, I'm stating the obvious here, um, and again, echoing some of what Suzanne, I think, said as well. But the definitions or boundaries of land art um, as a category are far from self-evident. Miwon Kwan and Philip Kaiser in their opening talk of the series reiterated key arguments from their 2012 exhibition, Ends of the Earth. Um, and in that catalog and exhibition, um, they make a number of arguments, including um, by approaching land art as a historically bounded category, um, and also one that was far more heterogeneous than has often been portrayed. So they argue, for instance, that it was international in scope, 
that it engaged um, from the beginnings, urban as well as remote desert landscapes, that it was concerned with media, not only sculpture, et cetera. My own dissertation research, which was finished around the same time in 2010, looked at land-based practices by artists from the 1960s relative to environmental and land use politics of the day, specifically examining the per pervasive taste for disrupted sites or wastelands, um, places that were blatantly not Arcadian, not traditionally scenic, not pristine on the part of vanguard um, or what we might now call critical artists at the time. I ultimately included in that project quote, that in the midst of pronounced social and environmental crises in relationship to the land, for example, the increasing reality and recognition that humans were impacting certain lands to the point of rendering them unproductive um, and or even uninhabitable, to confront wasted lands was to confront the contemporary, unquote. Um, I was also arguing in that dissertation that to thrust this um, work back into the uh, geographical and spatial political contexts of its day um, is also a way to, um, to underscore its relevance beyond art history or beyond the art world, um, both then and now. So in line with this, I think one way to approach the topic of art and environmentalism is to look at ways that specific artworks respond to, embody, illuminate, and or trouble particular environment related ideas, positions, and debates. We could, for instance, look at uh, Robert Smithson's unrealized 1970 project, Island of Broken Glass, for which he proposed to dump roughly 100 tons of green tinted glass on Miami Islet, which is just south of Nanaimo on Vancouver Island's coastline. As many of you know already, this project was blocked because of resistance or protests from environmental activists who were concerned about the impact that this installation would have on nesting birds. Um, when Smithson received a telegram in January of 1970 from the Canadian government announcing that this project was going to be blocked, he was more than a little bit irritated. Um, not only because he insisted that he and gallerist Douglas Christmas had checked to make sure that Miami Islet didn't support any wildlife. This is Smithson. Quote, we were very thorough about that, he responded. We checked carefully to make sure there would be no ecological disturbance, unquote. But also he was more generally highly critical of the growing ecology movement in that period, which he sometimes referred to as a wilderness cult in which he saw as retrograde conservative and quote, a kind of picture book sentimental, very trite romanticism, unquote. There are lots and lots of um, quotes that we could pull to support this kind of positioning that he had or feeling he had about the ecology movement. Um, that last sort of phrase was from uh, in an interview with, Doug, uh, with Wheeler, Dennis Wheeler. In an interview with two students from 1973, he said, quote, ecology is more religious, less political, insofar as it is really a nostalgia for the 19th century notion of landscape. Ecology actually could use some criticism because it often, it is often a rather hysterical response to devastation or what appears to be devastation, unquote. So artists, oops, I meant to forward the slide. Um, artists like Smithson uh, were e really eager to distance themselves from anything that smacked of romanticism. And there were multiple reasons for that. Um, even if, as I've written elsewhere, their own work fell prey to certain other fantasies, such as the artist as pioneer, or maybe more specifically, cowboy pioneer. Um, beyond this particular instance where an artwork was blocked um, by environmental activists, if we look more broadly at the reception of earthworks um, among critics and uh, journalists in the late 60s and other artists, um, there was lots of disapproval of earthworks by Smithson and others really from the get-go on the basis of being destructive to the land or the environment. You may recall that a couple of weeks ago in her talk, Patricia Johansson shared this work, Garden of Sulfur and Tar for Bob from 1969, uh, which she produced in part um, to send the message to Smithson that she thought it was deeply problematic that he was using such toxic materials in the production of his work. And I think it's worth noting that both uh, Johansson and Smithson staked out very highly nuanced positions 
through their work relative to environmental politics of the day. That's not true for all artists of the day, but both of them uh, did. So I think by looking back at specific works and their reception, uh, the contours of various historically and geographically specific ideas about environment come into clearer view. And of course, this isn't only true for historical works. Uh, we could certainly um, look at the controversies surrounding recent smoke works by Judy Chicago as another instance, which becomes a place where different ideas and value systems about art, about land, about environment, about publics come into contact uh, with one another. So I guess one of the main contributions or arguments, points I wanna to make today um, speaking in this conversation regards um, what I think is the really crucial need to situate or provincialize environmentalisms with an S. Um, it's helpful for instance, I think to look back to this kind of 60s, 70s period and also think about what was happening in other parts of the world. So I'm gonna show just two artworks and speak much too briefly about a context that I don't know a whole lot about myself, which is Eastern Europe um, in the 70s. So on the left, we have um, Peter Stembera's transpos transposition of stones from 1971. He was a Czech artist and the Polish artist Natalia LL's um, points of support from 1978. And I wanna reference um, the really exciting art historical work by Maya and Robin Ruben Fawkes on um, land art or uh, environmental art um, in the Eastern Bloc in the 1970s. And in their um, work, um, some of what they have spoken about or, or drawn attention to is how different um, the contexts were in different countries in the Eastern Bloc at that point in time, and the specific challenges that were um, sort of present for artists who were interested in taking up environmental issues or content in their work. Um, so for instance, in Czechoslovakia, uh, once the Soviet tanks arrived in 1968, there was really harsh censorship of art. And um, as the Fauks sort of describe it, um, one of the sort of impetuses for artists moving into spaces of nature to make work was that it was easier for them to avoid the gaze of secret police and informers. That's a really different motivation to work outside than it was for American artists in the desert west or even as it was for Polish artists at the time who were invited to do outdoor commissions. So Fawkes go on to say, quote, notably while artists in Poland were officially uh, invited to do their work in the countryside in Czechoslovakia, they were seeking refuge from surveillance by the authorities, unquote. So again, I think it's really helpful to um, sort of always be working to contextualize sort of um, what we're talking about. Uh, it goes without saying, or it's another kind of obvious point that there's not one environmentalism, but there are many environmentalisms. Um, environmentalism as a word, um, I think is sometimes perceived as a rallying call um, for others, maybe it's a bad word. Among some communities, it's taken to have obvious shared meaning and positive associations. For others, um, it uh, can be a, a foreign or alienating term. Increasingly, um, environmentalism as a term, also as a kind of movement, has been recognized for um, its exclusionary aspects. So by authors, among others, like Carolyn Finney, Laurette Savoy, and Drew Lanham on the right of Birding Wild Black fame. If you haven't checked out his writing and or his videos, I highly recommend looking at his work. Um, I should say first, I, I can't remember in the introduction if Bill mentioned um, my current position. So for the last three years, I've been an assistant professor, uh, joint professor at University of Oregon. And I, I mention it because I think it's sort of relevant to contextualize myself. So. I started a joint professorship three years ago at the University of Oregon, um, and I, I, I am uh, both in teaching contemporary art history, but I am also a core faculty member in environmental studies. And that's been an interesting shift for me, and it's been a really excited vantage point because you know I'm teaching both art history classes, but also straight up environmental studies classes. And um, part of the attraction for me of coming to University of Oregon is the strength of the environmental studies program. There's really exceptional kind of work happening in environmental humanities and climate um, and environmental justice at the University of Oregon. And I've learned a lot. So I think my own orientation has also shifted or my interest in environmental justice um, sort of scholarship and, and work has, has only strengthened by being in this current sort of um, institutional setting. 
Okay. So depending on which strand of environmentalism that we follow, very different maps or histories of art emerge. So different constellations of works, different tactics come into view. So this is going to be a really quick kind of surveyistic kind of um, gloss. But um, if we were to think, for instance, about um, kind of maybe mainstream or what has been a dominant environmentalism and a fairly white environmentalism in the United States with a conservation and wilderness orientation. So this is one strain that has placed tremendous value on the scenic and so-called intrinsic value of nature. So we could think to the Hudson River School painters. Um, and again, this is like a broad stroke. We could think to Sierra Club photographers um, in the 60s and 70s, including Ansel Adams, of course. We could think of the work of Andy Goldsworthy. Um, and I'm not sure exactly where, this is Adams on the left and Bertinsky on the right. I'm not exactly sure where we fit in someone like Bertinsky or Richard Misrock. Um, they also are very different from one another. Whether we think of that as being kind of part of that same lineage of aesthetically oriented landscape photography, even if it's um, depicting despoiled landscapes as opposed to pristine, or if this is sort of um, a counter to that, that first tradition. Um, we could also um, sort of map out a more um, scientific uh, oriented strain of uh, art making that deals with environment. Uh, a lot of works that have been more closely um, affiliated with ecological or eco art. We could think about the work of the Harrisons, Melchin's Revival Field from 1993, a reclamation or remediation project, um, similar to the kinds that uh, Suzanne was referencing. Uh, the work of Brandon Ballinger more recently in his project Crude Life, which is a really interesting project looking at the post-natural ecologies in Louisiana after the BP oil spill. Maya Lynn's What is Missing project on species extinction, um, not so much an art project, but a documentary project and scientific project by James Baylog that was sort of profiled in the film Chasing Ice. This is a still from that. Um, or um, one of many, many projects that are um, dealing with uh, sort of raising awareness of climate change. Um, this is the Tempestry, Tempestry Project, a public art initiative uh, aimed at raising climate change awareness um, by inviting knitters and crocheters to stitch temperature data into long tapestries. Um, we could think of a also, a, a sort of different yet another kind of um, strain or category of works that understand concepts of nature and environment to be um, fundamentally political and that is closer to um, uh, sort of an orientation that denaturalizes or seeks to denaturalize environmentalism or denaturalize nature. Um, and I personally feel most closely affiliated or interested in sort of these types of works. It's what I mostly have been involved with. Um, as a as an, uh, scholar primarily, an artist too, but more, and more as a scholar. Um, so for instance, in this book that Bill mentioned, The Rutledge Companion to Contemporary Art, Visual Culture and Climate Change that just came out earlier this year that I co-edited, um, we really refuse in that volume, and we speak about this in the introduction, to view climate change as merely or even primarily a matter of carbon-driven earth systems transformation and instead really um, demand, like others have demanded, that we must think about climate change in terms of the ways that it's inextricably linked to wider representational, socio-political, geopolitical, and techno-financial structures and histories. Um, our own work, and I think I speak for all three of the editors in that volume, um, we take deep inspiration from environmental, the environmental justice movement, which insists that you know, words or terms like nature, landscape, uh, environment can never be thought of outside of um, thinking also about structures of power. Um, and so we're deeply influenced by that work and also selected um, scholars, artists, and activists to um, contribute to the vol volume that we're really representing um, sort of environmental justice uh, positions. So people like Macarena gomez Barres, Nick Estes and Melanie Yazzie of Red Nation and many, many others. Um, the cover image on this book is from an artwork um, that was produced by the collective, the Natural History Museum, uh, in connection with 
the Latinx uh, Environmental Justice Advocacy Group, Tejas. And I won't talk about the project really uh, much at all, except to say that this project uh, really was um, focusing on this highly toxic petrochemical corridor of Houston. And one piece of the project involved distributing air monitors for citizen monitoring of air pollution uh, in this area where brown and black communities are being disproportionately impacted, not surprisingly, it's almost always the case that that's how it works um, in, this, in this city. So um, this is one of the projects that um, I am writing about, for instance, in this book that, um, that my current book project that Bill mentioned on art and environmental violence and art that's tracking environmental violence. We could also think about a project like Rebecca Belmore, the Ashinaabe artist Rebecca Belmore's artifact uh, number 671B from 1988 about which Jessica Horton has written. Um, this uh, performance or intervention um, uh, was um, happened uh, in uh, conjunction with the Calgary Winter Olympics or in response to it. And for this performance, Belmore tagged her body like an artifact. Um, and one of the things she, the most prominent thing she was wearing was a Shell corporate logo. So she was marking um, the kind of simultaneous uh, sponsorship of the Olympics by Shell Oil, but also its corporate incursion uh, into First Nations space. So um, we also could look to the work of the Colombia Mestiza artist, Carolina Caicedo, her Be Damned project, which she began in 2013, uh, which has many parts to it, but it's a project, a large scale project that's looking at transnational dams, particularly in um, South America and the displacement of peasants and peasant lifeways um, and the impact upon food sovereignty and all sorts of other sort of aspects of um, various uh, lifeways in uh, places like along the Yuma River in Colombia. Here is one of the geo choreographies that she staged with a community there along the banks of a river that was soon to be flooded by the construction of a dam. Um, so her project looks um, really at the complexity of hydropower, which is interesting also because we think of it as a green technology. Um, she has spoken at times also about this correlation, which I think many of us maybe weren't aware of, aren't aware of, or should be more aware of, that there's a kind of, um, uh, along with the removal of dams in North America, which of course is uh, widely celebrated by many people, many environmentalists, many tribal um, sort of groups, this parallels an unprecedented construction of dams in the global South and in South America specifically. So she asked us to sort of think about these, these uh, relationships really, um, exciting work. Pope L in his Flint Water Project from 2017 went into people's homes and asked to buy contaminated, contaminated water, which he then bottled and sold uh, to fundraise and raise awareness of the issue of this catastrophe in Flint, Michigan. Um, we could also look to the work of the Finnish artists Terka Hapoya and Laura Gustafsson, their Museum of Non-Humanity, again, a project that I can, no way can do justice in such a short amount of time but a project which sort of imagines a museum um, after this um, false and um, really violent bifurcation of sort of human from non-human or human from object is in the past. So they imagine a kind of museum um, beyond this phase that we live in now. And they make through this project um, kind of an argument that the fight for non-human rights or non-human justice um, and the fight for social justice is the same fight or that they're intimately connected because both um, oppose the objectification or devaluation of some lives over others. Last, I just wanna close by referencing um, some things that the artist Raven Chacon said just a week or two ago in his talk in this series. Um, he spoke about very early works of his field recordings from 1999, and this is the last um, image I have and thing I'll say. Um, which you know, were projects where he was going out into the landscape, interested to listen to the landscape and um, created these recordings that amplified the sounds of a place, radically amplified them. But he made the point that um, it wasn't um, an approach of going out to listen to the landscape in a way that um, uh, erased um, the violent histories that are central to these places, but that um, included and amplified that as well. So he, he said he had no interest in approaching these places from a kind of meditative or peaceful approach. He wasn't, wasn't interested in a peaceful experience in these places because these aren't peaceful places. Um, 
And so I thought it was really interesting that implicitly then, you know, this Pete, these set of pieces or his points about them also draw our attention to the ways that Western environmentalism itself with these kinds of practices that many of us, including myself in my, all my years as a park ranger are very, very used to and may feel like um, are very familiar, you know, familiar to us and ones that we practice ourselves of sort of seeking out a kind of quiet or pure experience in nature that those experience, uh, those approaches themselves, those practices um, produce and perpetuate really violent dispossessions and erasures. So many of the works in this last set um, really have, I think, largely fallen outside of the purview of environmentalist discourse and environmentally interested art historical discourse as well. Um, I'm not sure how often they're really identifiable or identified as environmental artworks. And indeed, I think many of these artists themselves may not be interested in um, using the tag environmentalist to, to these works. So I would just end by um, saying that in order to address questions or the topic of land arts relationship to environmentalism, I think we need to first and continually ask uh, which land art and which environmentalism. And I will end there. Emily, thank you. And Suzanne, thank you. Those are two powerful, dense, elegant arguments to utterly explode land art. And I cannot thank you both enough for, uh, for linking to the works that we have on the walls here right now and the, the other presentations that we've been putting forth. Uh, Suzanne, I love it that you brought up Jackie Bruckner uh, because we have our archive now. Um, and we've just begun to parse through that and organize it. And it's uh, thrilling to see that there is recognition by you also of, of her important works. I'm glad to hear that. She, she was so important and not recognized enough. So I'm, I'm, de I'm delighted that you have her stuff. Yeah, yeah we are too. And then, uh, you know, Emily Scott, good heavens. I, I, you know, when you, I saw you in Switzerland, you know, several years ago and you announced you were coming to the University of Oregon. And I got so excited because you were going to be a neighbor, which is what how you, you said <laughs> next door, you know. Um, in the West, that's a neighbor. <laughs> exactly. So in the West, that's a neighbor. And and for me in Queens, uh, Manhattan is a neighbor. <laughs> well, I know. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Emily, uh, uh, you know, it's really a pleasure for us to interact with your joint professorship, as you will, um, because we have, uh, you know, for instance, um, uh, an archive from Aaron Moore, the architect who's teaching at the University of Oregon, um, and whose mother, uh, Kathleen D. Moore, is a, a noted, uh, you know, paragon of moral virtue in the environmental movement in this country. So um, all of these nice intersecting circles uh, are just thrilling to witness in the program. Look, uh, we're running up close to time. We still have maybe 20 minutes or so because we're going to go over as we agreed. Uh, Kristen, would you step in? I think you probably have some questions from the audience. Now, why don't you let us respond to each other? Oh, fine. Well, if you'd like to do that first, Suzanne and Emily, absolutely, please do. Hey, uh, Emily, I just want to say, uh, I think the work you're doing is so important. I mean, I, I also, you know, also know I have ambivalence about it as art, but good you recognize that. But, uh, but I would just like to say, regarding your examination of the term environmentalist, I'd like to propose that instead, you consider environmental because environmental arts, I mean, really started, as I said, with um, Capro, but also Carl Andre, uh, the minimalist doing in, they talked about doing interior environments. And from that, it really, but, and I consider the work that I wrote my book, Earthworks book about to be spatially environmental, but not environmentalist. Because I think environmentalist from the 60s, from um, uh, you know, from Rachel Carson, uh, distinctly has a political association. For that reason, I mean, for example, at one of the previous triennials, I spoke to Bertinsky, and I've also spoken to um, Richard Mizrak, who's both have worked, I, both of them refuse to identify themselves as environmentalists because they think that would make them a political artist. But in fact, they do environmentalist art, but they don't want to be called themselves. I mean, let's, that, that's just another term. It's spatially, that early work is spatially environmental. 
but, and then there's other work that's, that might not even be spatially environmental, but it's environmentalist. So those two terms need to be distinguished. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I think you're right. I think all of these words are so loaded, whether it's environment or nature or land, landscape, yeah, environmentalist. Yeah. I think they're all you know, deeply loaded and complicated terms that are used differently, that are deployed or resisted, mm -hmm. depending mm -hmm. on the perspective. So, I mean, I guess this is sort of an obvious thing to do maybe, but it also maybe holds together my work for quite a long time now is just um, really arguing for the importance of kind of precision and specificity. I agree with you that the intentionality of artists is one maybe piece of the picture that can be taken into consideration. But I also think questions of reception are always um, relevant. And I think that you also mentioned this in your talk, there's the issue of kind of reception in a particular moment, and then sort of moving forward, various receptions from different vantage points. And I think it's interesting I, what you said about um, the kind of derision of earthworks now, or the like sort of blind celebration of earthworks now, there's both um, very detectable, I think in um, kind of uh, among my students even, let's say, right? Like they're really excited about earthworks, but they also are very quick to sort of cast them out as being patriarchal, settler colonial, um, sexist, et cetera. And so with my students, um, I try to um, work with them again, to keep developing these, skills, which in a way is kind of part of the role of art history as a discipline, right, is to... Um, well, you could say, yeah, they were. To think they about, were. To think but that was, the, that, that was the values yeah. of the day. You know? Yeah, but also to, that, but then you can think about how artworks become apertures into learning about um, the kind of complexity yeah. of culture or politics at a particular moment. Um, I think that this question from Julian Meyer Sapinska, I'm not sure sure if everyone can see that or if somebody's gonna read it, but I think it's related to this question of contexts. Um, so do we read it out loud or can everyone see it, Bill? Emily, you can read it out loud, please. Okay, so he thanks us. Um, uh, and I'm just gonna read, read your question, Julian. Um, I wish you could say it yourself. Quote, one thing your presentation share is a set of critical questions around the very idea that frames this lecture series of expanding the Atlas, which parallels one claim of ends of the earth um, that land art was an international movement. My question is this, who gets lost when we expand the category in this way? Land means different things in different national contexts and historical moments uh, in Eastern Europe versus America and Israel and the Zionist project of greening the desert and so on and engaging with this artistically changes too. I'm also interested if you can talk about what changes with the shift in the 70s from land art being funded by private patrons to being funded by institutions and cities. How should this inform our understanding of the reparative uh, model that emerges? This is the end of the that, question. That's in my last chapter of my Earthworks book <laughs> about the, how, how the difference of shift, the patronage shifted from Earthworks to land art. And then also, then once you have institutions that patronizing it, then they often, I mean, this was not true of Michelle Stewart, they often want, um, want it to be, uh, okay, externally reinforced. They don't want it to go away after they put their money into it. I mean, that's another fa factor. But I mean, it's a really interesting question. Who gets lost when we expand the category in this way? Because I think the kind of um, probably um, motivation or like the intention behind expanding an atlas is to expand uh, the inclusion of things that were previously excluded. But of course, I think Julian's right when he says that there are things lost along the way of um, even approaching it about thinking about expanding a category. So I'm not sure if I succeeded in my comments. I think my comments parallel some of what Julian is saying about the necessity of thinking about sort of differences and exclusions and gaps. And um, I like this kind of, I, one reason I'm, I'm very partial to this work like Colleen Smith's remote viewing or Justin Favela's um, uh, double negative uh, fiesta and also frankly the work of Julia Myers and Sapinska and Edgar Arsenault uh, who spoke earlier in the series is this idea of sort of doing work that sort of um, looks back but in a way that sort of um, recognizes the kind of unfixity of work sort of both in their time and today and that kind of recognize that somehow like in the work is this element of kind of distortion or thinking about different 
perspectives coming into contact, um, different vantage points, whether sort of across time, across space, across cultures, et cetera. Um, I don't know exactly how to further answer that question um, in terms of the shift, um, but I, I do think that kind of um, precision in terms of thinking about um, institution and modes of um, funding and circulation are absolutely critical to sort of how we sort of think about how works operate, how certain works are like even come into existence, are allowed to be made or not made, et cetera. Um, yeah, one, one more thing. I, I think it's interesting that Emily and I are arguing for the same thing, but from different perspectives because uh, Emma, Emily is, is wants to, you might denature nature and make it culture, which is absolutely the correct. I mean, how we view nature is a, is a cultural, uh, historical perspective. And so she wants, I mean, she's to me more the social political contextualization. And I, with Smithson, have definitely been the more individualist contextualization. And I wanna say, uh, Emily, I mean, and to everyone, regarding Smithson, damning so much. He, you're, you're absolutely correct. He, he wanted to divorce himself from nature, said, you know, he's into, he, he's, he thinks uh, nature is just a big gallery or, or he's, not, he's not interested in, in he, he's rejecting the romanticism. When someone is that, has that much um, animosity, you know, has that much oomph, you know that it's something in him that he wants to reject. And let me, let me read you something he wrote. A terrible yearning for innocence stares back over original sin into some impossible paradise. You see, he, I mean, I mean, this is like aside from, you know, if you want to give a political reading, you don't count this in. But if you want to give a personal biographical reading, you think, wait a minute, he is rejecting in himself his own desire for some kind of impossible paradise of nature. And he, th he thinks that's, that's just too romantic and he, he doesn't want to appear to be that way with the other fellas. So he rejects, uh, he, he rejects this uh, idea of the, the environmentalists, the tree huggers. Okay, but anyway, I, I wanted to say just two two quick things to respond to you. And I, I mean, of course, if there are more questions coming from the audience, we want to pay attention to those two. I currently don't see any, but um, let's like let's make this maybe the wrap up this discussion. Let's make this the kind of the wrap up. Sure. Okay, well, well, I was well. just well, I was just going to say that I wanted to just kind of slightly resist this framing of um, me being interested. It is true that a lot of my work has been interested in kind of denaturalization, but the de you said something about denaturalizing nature. And I'm, I'm also really, um, you know, eager to make sure that sort of um, non-human species, non-human kind of like, you know, influenced by multi-species ethnography and all sorts of other work. And just my work, you know, doing kind of layperson ecology, being a eco layperson ecologist, naturalist as a park ranger. I'm also really interested in kind of, um, work that resists anthropocentrism. So I think I'm not at all what I would call like a purely social construction of nature kind of person that thinks it's all culture. Um, <laughs> I'm really interested in non-human rights, non-human justice, um, sort of non-human ways of knowing and sensing. So I just, just to kind of clarify that point. Um, and so the other thing I was going to say, um, which a little bit is referring back to this kind of question, uh, the questions that Julian posed um, is about kind of how influential for me, at least the work, like the body of work um, by artists, but also people have written about them, um, some of which are the same people on institutional critique is, um, this has been like one of the most kind of formin formative kind of um, strains of art making in my work, because again, it gets to these questions of sort of the apparatuses that allow the production of certain things that sort of um, facilitate the circulation and the reception of things. And I do think that, you know, when I open by saying that I think, you know, it's worth sort of asking that question about sort of you know, is, is the motivation for a, an exhibition or a book or an essay or this lecture series um, to kind of secure something within a canon. Um, and of course that probably is part of it. 
like these are institutional questions. And I think um, that it's always important to keep like close at view those kinds of questions about, um, you know, both the systems through which, and this is very Smithson, of course, he was really interested in the institutions through which the artist is threaded. He says this would become the major issue for artists in the 70s. And I think it continues to be a really like a uh, ripe set of questions. Um, but uh, we could think about historical work or contemporary work or anything in between. I think always um, being mindful of these, um, you know, kind of material limits, um, discursive limits, or, you know, um, kind of frameworks through which and against which and within which works, you know, sort of, again, like come into being. And um, so I'm always really interested in those. I, I think of them as kind of meta questions, but they're almost like institutional questions, um, which often quickly lead to all questions of power and sort of who's included, who's not included, who gets to speak, who gets to frame, et cetera. So. Isn't, isn't yeah. there anyone out there that wants to know something from us? <laughs> well, I think, you know, I, I think again, the discussion, What's remarkable to me is how much you have encompassed in both of your your presentations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you've you know, um, I mean, Julia Julian is replying here to something. So Emily, if you're looking at your screen, um, you know, he's he's basically saying one of the great things about your historicization of environmentalism is that it should remind us that contrary to our contemporary associations, environmentalism is not an absolute value or always a leftist project. Environmentalism conservation has been at times historically been embraced by conservatives and racists too. So that's, yeah. it just keeps getting more and more complicated. Yeah. I don't want to dominate too much, but thank you for that comment. Um, I was just going to say, this is where I feel like um, in developing and teaching now a couple of times the required intro to environmental humanities course at University of Oregon, it's been so helpful for me to go back and um, be looking at and teaching texts on like really the history of environmentalism and also new work that's been done, which was not at all on my radar when I was a ranger. Um, a lot of these questions weren't on my, you know, on my radar. I was interested in like politics and visual kind of histories of nature, kind of inflected from studying art history in the early 90s. Uh, but I was, there were a lot of other things that are on my radar now that weren't then, but um, looking at sort of recent studies so there, you know there have been like more and more sort of scholarship on the direct connection between early conservationism in the late 19th early 20th century and eugenics um there's been really important historical work done um on how the kind of production of national parks has involved a very like active strategic um set of erasures and exclusions and dispossessions um, that can be traced, you know, in really precise ways to like in order for Glacier National Park to exist in this wonderful essay William Spence wrote, um, I think that's, I'm getting his name right. He talks about this kind of um, exclusion of indigenous people who are originally sort of used almost or like invited in as props to kind of attract tourisms, but then were like sort of increasingly um, sort of um, removed from the space in order to produce this image of nature. And this is one reason I loved what Raven said so much, Raven Chacon, about this sort of going out to these landscapes and being interested in listening to um, the land, but in a way that's not um, dependent upon this uh, kind of really problematic notion of like silence or a kind of spiritual interaction with nature, which is a ritual that's tied to, you know, a particular kind of white settler colonial experience of nature. So I think, yeah, for it, me, it goes back to the Bible. Sure, yeah, we could trace it back. It goes, to you know, it goes back to the the, the Bible. The nature as refuge. When I mean, after it was no longer nature as a dangerous place between settle settlements. Yeah, and we're and we're only talking now in a kind of um, you know U.S. settler colonial United States context, and then you know as. Julian's questions pointed out too. And like in the book I'm working on, one of the, the middle chapters looking at work by Fazal Shaikh and forensic architecture, Ail Weitzman on this greening of the desert in the Negev, the Israeli-Palestine context in the way that like the climate has been engineered there in a way to um, basically take lands from uh, uh, nomadic Bedouin uh, herdsmen and hand it over that the Israeli state is handing it over for Israeli settlement and the way that their kind of environment is deployed as a strategic weapon. So, I mean, it's, there, you know, I think to 
be as careful as we can about, you know, provincializing our own scholarship, but thinking about kind of the context that so many complicated overlapping, you know, sometimes paradoxical, paradoxical contexts in which the work we're writing about is made and also in which we as uh, writers or thinkers are making our work. Yeah. And then, then we have to turn to Bill and thank him for, for um, simulating this forum of rethinking. Well, Susanna and Emily, I, thank you so much. I mean, that was the hope that Ann Wolf and David Walker, mm -hmm. uh, Joanne Northrup and I had, uh, you know, was to, was to figure out um, not just where the artists were going, um, but why, and in response to what, and how are they leading a discussion? And that gets, I mean, that's of great interest, obviously, to me in archives, because we collect archives from living people. So it's an activist archive, in a sense, where we're actually saying we want to collect a trace of this, of this knowledge that you're developing, this exploration you're conducting now while you're actually doing it. So we want to be part of it. Uh, it it makes the job of being an archivist um, rather interesting because you are you, you have to be very careful like an anthropologist in a sense working with a native tribe somewhere you know you, I don't want to influence the outcome here I just want to witness and of course that's almost impossible to do I mean any good physicist would tell you but so uh, look I, we need to wrap up the conversation I'm gonna I'm gonna thank you again I have not heard um, two such enveloping conversations about a king off from land art in my life. It's fabulous, thank you. Um, thank you. Such a pleasure to have you here.